Hi, everyone. Welcome to Conservation Conversations. My name is Ana Sangronis, and I work for the University of Florida IFAS Extension Service and Florida Sea Grant here in Miami-Dade County. This webinar series is a joint effort between UF IFAS Extension, Florida Sea Grant, and Miami-Dade County Eco Adventures. We will be offering this webinar series every second and fourth Wednesday at 12 noon through the end of the year. Thank you for tuning in today. Everyone in this webinar is currently muted, so I ask that you type any questions that you may have into the chat box, which will be moderated by Ed Pritchard, my colleague, and myself. We will have an opportunity for Q&A at the end of this session. This webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be sent out within the next week. Please follow us on social media where we will be advertising the monthly topics, or instead, if you'd like to receive an email reminder with the topics and registration link, please email me or indicate so in the chat box. Now, I'm very excited to turn it over to today's esteemed guest presenter, Dr. Kelly Yakola of the Dolphin Research Center. Thank you for, having, for joining us, Kelly. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Anna said, I'm Dr. Kelly Yakola, I'm director of Sorry about that, I temporarily got muted. I hope you can all hear me. Um, not sure how much you heard, so let me say that again, that I'm a Director of Research at Dolphin Research Center, or DRC, uh, in the Florida Keys. And today, I wanna to talk to you about the really awesome animals that are dolphins. And if we can get the technology, good. So specifically, I'm gonna start by telling you about some of our research on dolphin cognition and communication. And then after that, We'll talk about conservation threats to wild dolphins and the role that marine mammal facilities like DRC play in addressing some conservation issues. So first, let's start with cognition. Now, what do we mean by that? When we're talking about cognition, we're talking about what's going on inside an animal's mind, how they think, learn, remember, solve problems, that sort of thing. But the problem is you can't see a mind, right? So how do you study it? Well, you have to problem solve. What you do is you set up a situation, an experience, a puzzle, something that goes into the animal's mind, and then you see what comes out the other side, a behavior, a response, a, an answer. So we know what went in and we know what came out. And from there, we can figure out what happened in the middle, right? What those cognitive processes were. And of course, you can study cognition like that in any animal whether it's a dolphin or a dog or a bird or a bee or a human. And when you do, you're gonna get different answers because of course all minds are not the same. And that's a really important point that I want everyone to keep in mind, especially when we bring human minds into the mix. Because see, the thing is we're really used to our own minds. So it's very easy to assume that animal minds, in this case, dolphin minds are really just like ours but they're not. Dolphins have their own minds, which have evolved separately from ours for 90 to 95 million years in a very different body type, in a very different kind of environment. They're not just like us. So what we're trying to figure out is, what's a dolphin's mind like? So to give you just a flavor of that today, I'm gonna to tell you about two of our studies on dolphin cognition. First, we'll talk about a study on dolphin communication, and then we'll talk about cooperation. All right, but to tell you about the research, the study on dolphin communication, first I need to give you a crash course on dolphin communication in general. Ready? Here goes. Bottlenose dolphins make three basic types of sounds. First, there are the clicks that they use for echolocation. That's their biological sonar. And that sounds kind of like a creaking door. Oh. Next are what we call burst pulse sounds. These are the squeals, blats, growls, et cetera, that seem to be used for emotion type of communication. And then every time someone comes in, I get knocked off of here, sorry about that. Um, and then there are narrow band whistles, which dolphins use in a really interesting way. And so that's what we're gonna focus on today. Now, when scientists are analyzing whistles, uh, they generally use something called a spectrogram. You can think of it sort of like a graph of sound. So on the y-axis is the frequency. That's how high or how low a sound is. And then on the x-axis is time. 
So what you see here is a spectrogram of a dolphin whistle, and you can see that the whistle goes up and then down and then up and then down. I'm gonna play it here so that you can hear it. All right, so that's what a dolphin whistle sounds like. But if you were to stick a hydrophone, that is an underwater microphone, uh, in with a group of dolphins, you're actually gonna hear a bunch of different types of whistles. So what's going on there? Well, some people used to think that those whistles might be like words in some kind of a dolphin language, but it turns out they're not. That is not what the dolphins are doing. Instead, what's happening is that each individual dolphin has their own individual whistle that they make over and over and over. So for example, the dolphin marina might make that first whistle over and over, flagler might make the second one, pandora may make the third one, and so forth. Each dolphin has their own whistle that they make most of the time. And then sometimes they'll make another dolphin's whistle. But why? Well, what scientists think is that these individual whistles, which we call signature whistles, are vocal labels, kind of like names, uh, in the sense that they refer to a specific individual and they allow dolphins to keep in acoustic contact with each other. Now, I should point out they're not exactly like names, but we'll get to that in just a second. Okay, so if dolphins are using these individually specific signature whistles to keep in contact, then of course, one of the most important examples of that has to be to allow moms and calves to keep in contact and find each other again when they're apart. But how does that work? So let's say a dolphin mom and her calf are swimming apart from each other, each doing their own thing. What does the mom do when she wants her calf to come back? Now to ask this question scientifically, you need to set up a situation where we know the mom wants her calf to come. That's not something you can do in the wild, but in a marine mammal facility like ours, you can just ask her. So that's what we did. We started this study, uh, we did this study with one of our dolphins named Marina, who had a four month old calf named Windley at the time. And what we did is like we often do, we started with a game that Marina already knows, which was to go get something or to retrieve something. So what we did is when uh, Marina was doing a session with a trainer, her calf would be off doing her own thing. And the trainer would look for cases where the calf was on the other side of the lagoon. And then she would say, hey, Marina, go get your baby. So I'm gonna show you a video of what that looks like. Um, and I'm gonna be quiet during it because there is some sound, but just to preview it, on the bottom there is a spectrogram, and that's a spectrogram of the trial. So you can see what the, what the sounds are. All right, so here we go. The, dolph the trainer is gonna ask Marina to go get her baby. And she did it. Um, so what you'll notice is that when the trainer asked Marina to go get her baby, Marina immediately whistled. But the question is, what did she whistle? So I want to ask you guys what you think. We're going to do a poll and you can guess um, or maybe you know. So what did the dolphin mom do when she wanted her calf to come to her? Did she make her own signature whistle? Did she make the calf's signature whistle? Or did she make a different whistle altogether? Go ahead and type in whatever you think. I feel like I should be playing Jeopardy music. All right, it looks like we're about evened out. So I'm gonna end the poll here and then can we see the results? Oh, someone else did. Uh, share results. Is that what I'm doing? Sorry. All right. So you guys said for the most part that uh, she was making her calf signature whistle. Well, let's see what actually happened. If I can get rid of this poll here. Yeah. All right, so which whistle was it? Was it Marina's whistle? Was it the calf's whistle like you guys thought or was it some third whistle altogether? And the answer is it was Marina's whistle. So that answers our question. Right? What does a dolphin mom do when she wants her calf to come back? She makes her own signature whistle. And notice, which is what tripped you guys up, notice how different this is from human names. Right, So when you were a kid 
and you were off playing outside and your mom wanted you to come in, I guarantee you she did not stand on your front porch and call her own name over and over, right? That's how we do it, is we call the child's name, but the, the dolphins call their own name. Again, they're different, kind of cool. All right, so next let's look at cooperation. And again, let me set this up for you. So if you look at uh, animal behavior in the wild, you are going to see situations where animals seem to be cooperating, right? So you'll have some situations where you might see them drive off predators together, uh, or you'll see two different animals digging a hole together, or they may be hunting together. And we know that dolphins are one of the animals to do this. So for example, the behavior on the right is something called strand fishing, where what a group of dolphins will do is they'll rush towards the beach together and that creates a wave in front of them that pushes the fish up onto the beach where they can just pick them off and then slide back into the water. But here's the thing, when you see this kind of behavior in the wild, you don't know whether those animals are actively cooperating or whether they're just doing the same thing at the same time. To give you an example, suppose you had two dogs hanging out uh, and a rabbit ran by. It is not unlikely that both of those dogs are gonna take off after that rabbit. But that's really different than them saying, hey, let's get that rabbit together. You go this way, I'll go that way. So in this study, what we were interested in is whether dolphins understand active cooperation. Can they actively cooperate? So they, can they understand a situation where they have to work together to accomplish task? And again, we started with a game. So we created this apparatus where there are two underwater buttons and the game is they have to press their buttons at the same time, specifically within a one second time window of each other. If they press them at the same time, they win. If only one dolphin presses their button or if one presses and the other one waits more than a second, then they lose that particular trial. And importantly, they had to do that even when they're sent at different times. And the reason this is important is suppose the dolphins just think, oh, here's the game, I press my button, right? So if they're sent at the same time and both of them are thinking, I press my button, then they'll be sent at the same time, they swim at the same time, they get there at the same time, they're each doing their own thing, but it looks like cooperation. However, what if we send them at different times? Now, that first dolphin is sent. If what they think is the game is press my button, they're gonna go over and press their button. Second dolphin's not there, so they lose. If they think the game is, we have to press our buttons together, then they're gonna wait until that second dolphin is also in position so they can press their buttons together. So that's the key. We had an overhead video camera so that we could see real clearly what was going on uh, at the buttons. And you're gonna see that one of the dolphins is gonna have a dot on its forehead. That's zinc oxide. It's the same stuff that's used in sunscreen. And the point there was just to be able to tell them apart as they're swimming quickly um, from an overhead camera. Okay, so what does a trial look like? Let's look. So one dolphin sent, then the other. And they got it. And these two particular boys really loved this game. You saw they pressed at the same time. They got the whistle, which tells them they were right. And then they you know, jumped out of the water. Yay, we got it. They were very excited about it. Now I want to show you a, a similar trial with a longer waiting period, but from an overhead camera. So you can see more clearly one dolphin waiting. Let's see if we can get this to go. You see them waiting, turning, looking. And then they get there together. So do dolphins actively cooperate? Yeah, they do. They were great at this game. You know, by the end of the study, I had told you that they needed to press within a one second time window. By the end of the study, they were averaging a third of a second between their button presses. That's super, super fast. So uh, what that kind of precision tells us is that yes, they absolutely understood they had to cooperate and they actively coordinated in a super precise way to synchronize their behavior that closely. All right, so that's the part of the talk on dolphin cognition and communication. And the thing I want you guys to remember, aside from dolphins are cool, is that dolphin minds are not just like ours. They've got their own minds, 
which have evolved separately from ours for a long time. So the important question is not how are they like us, but rather how do their minds work? Okay, so next I wanna talk about conservation and the role that marine mammal facilities play in addressing conservation issues. And let's start by asking you guys what you think. If you could just type in a few thoughts in the chat, uh, what are some conservation challenges that you think dolphins face in the wild? What are some things that threaten them, that make their life difficult, uh, that challenge them? So we'll give you a minute and then um, someone will read those off for me. Hey Kelly, we have pollution, boat noise, man-made sounds, plastic pollution, overfishing, global warming, contamination from ships, food shortages. Man, these answers are flowing in here. That's in, awesome. in some countries, the dolphins are hunted. All right, yes. So, uh, thank you. Yeah, so great job, everybody. Dolphins actually face a lot of conservation threats in the wild. So let me just summarize uh, some of the big ones, which I think you guys got uh, basically all of the big ones. But so as somebody said, look, in some parts of the world, dolphins are still hunted and killed, which is obviously a, a big issue. Less obvious to some people is the issue with harassing dolphins. And what I mean by harassing is getting close enough to wild dolphins that you impact their behavior. Now in the United States, this is illegal. But even if it weren't illegal, it's very dangerous for the dolphins because it interferes with really important behaviors such as hunting, breeding, and parenting. And you know, sometimes people even feed wild dolphins. And I get it, they probably think they're doing a good thing. They think they're helping the dolphins out, but they're not. When you feed wild dolphins, what you're doing is you're teaching that animal to approach boats because that's where the food is. And the problem is that when dolphins approach boats, they get hit by propellers, which can seriously injure them or kill them. So please, please, please do not feed wild dolphins. There are also big environmental disasters like oil spills. So for example, about 10 years ago, we had the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, which led to uh, what they call an unusual mortality event, which means a whole lot of dolphins died. And in fact, a whole lot of animals from a number of different species died. You've got marine debris. This is trash that makes its way to the ocean where animals can get entangled in it or they can ingest things that aren't food and that their bodies can't handle. And noise pollution. So this is loud noise from ships, military sonar, oil and gas exploration, and so forth. And the problem is, like we saw when we talked about dolphin communication, is that dolphins are highly acoustic animals. Hearing is really important to them. So loud noises interfere with their behavior and can even physically damage their ears. And of course, the underlying thing to all of this is people, right? It's us. Humans are the biggest conservation threat to wild dolphins, whether directly through harassing and killing them or indirectly through the many human practices that impact the environment that dolphins live in. And because people are the problem, we need to find ways for people to be the solution. And we need to use every strategy that we possibly can. So next, I want to talk about two key roles that marine mammal facilities play in addressing conservation issues. First, they provide opportunities for research and expertise with marine mammals in a way that's not possible to get in the wild. And second, they provide a really strong method for connecting the public to the relevant issues. Now, let me back up and explain what I mean. So first, the opportunity for research and expertise with dolphins in a way that's not possible to achieve in the wild. You know, before we had dolphins in marine mammal facilities, we didn't even know the basics about them. That is, how do dolphins even work? For example, the fact that they have echolocation, that biological sonar that lets them see with sound, that was discovered in marine mammal facilities because scientists had to have the animals up close in order to set up experiments to show, for example, that when you temporarily blindfold them, when you take away their sight temporarily, they can still navigate, they can still find targets and so on because they have this additional way to navigate at the location. Pregnancy and birth. Again, before we had dolphins in facilities, we didn't know basic information about this. Like how long is a dolphin's pregnancy and how is a baby dolphin born? These are things that are really hard to see in the wild, but in a marine mammal facility, you can watch it happen. Here's a photograph of one of our dolphins giving birth, and you can see that baby dolphins are born 
tail flukes first. You see the tail flukes coming out. Not only that, but we were able to watch the mom during pregnancy. We could track how much weight she was gaining and we could even use ultrasound to see the calf growing inside her. Uh, hearing range. Once we had the animals up close, we could give them hearing tests. So now we know what their hearing range is, which by the way, also tells us what range of sounds in the ocean can affect them. Lung physiology. This is a study from Dolphin Quest Oahu looking at lung function. So what they do is they ask a dolphin to breathe into that device you see there uh, in different situations. So maybe after the dolphin is resting or after they've exercised a bit. And from there, they can measure things like how fast the air is moving in and out of the dolphin's lungs, what the gas composition of their breath is and so forth in order to figure out how dolphin respiration works. And of course, cognition. Uh, we've already talked a bit about cognition, so I won't go into specifics here other than to say that to test a lot of things about how dolphins think and learn, you need to have the animals up close. You have to be able to present them with situations and puzzles with all the necessary scientific controls, consistency, and repetition that's just not possible to do in the wild. And by the way, that study right there is one that we didn't talk about now, but we can talk about later if you want, looking at whether dolphins understand the concept of less. So can they pick out the, the board with a fewer number of dots? All right, so in addition to all of this basic information, uh, research in marine mammal facilities has also, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, um, has also developed ways of assessing and improving the health of these animals. So this includes things like developing assessment equipment and techniques. So for example, a minute ago, I talked about dolphin ultrasounding. And this is what that looks like. So we ask the dolphin mom to lie still next to the dock and then in that little white box, uh, there's a portable ultrasound machine where, that we can use to image what's going on inside her. Scientists have also, believe it or not, developed ways to assess dolphin hearing by measuring their brain waves. Now, the first dolphin hearing tests that I talked about weren't this. Uh, in the first dolphin hearing test, they trained the dolphins to take a hearing test, much like you might do at a doctor's office. So if you hear a tone, raise your hand. For dolphins, they're not going to raise their hand, obviously, but for them it was if you hear a tone, press a button or press a paddle or something like that. And so from that, you can figure out which can they hear. What scientists did next is they uh, looked at the dolphins' brain waves while they were taking these hearing tests. So now they can tell whether the dolphin can hear the sound just by looking at their brain waves. And the reason that this is super important is now that allows us to test the hearing of animals who don't know how to take those hearing tests, for example, stranded animals. Okay, we've also learned a lot about physiological and behavioral baselines and deviations from those baselines. So for example, what are a dolphin's nutritional requirements? What is their blood chemistry when they're healthy versus when they're sick? How can you tell if a dolphin's sick? And how do you treat those illnesses? And once we have that information and those techniques, we can use them to assess and test stranded animals to immediately know, for example, whether a stranded animal has underlying respiratory problems or hearing problems, which is then going to change how we treat that animal. All right, so upshot. Uh, research in marine mammal facilities gives us a lot of information that you can't get in the wild. This includes most of what we know about dolphin physiology, healthcare, perception, and cognition. And it includes developing instruments and techniques for assessing these animals that can then be used to assess animals in the wild. Once we have that knowledge, that knowledge helps scientists research and interpret the behavior of wild dolphins and forms the basis of conservation practices. Just like research in any field, you have to understand how the system works before you can design solutions for that system. However, I wanna be really clear here. I am not saying that research in marine mammal facilities can replace wild research or that one is a better alternative than the other. No, the truth is to get a full understanding of these animals, we need both. There are some questions that can only be answered in the field. And there are other questions where you need the animals up close and personal. And those two different types of research work together to inform each other and give us a fuller picture of what dolphins are like. Okay. So the second big role that marine mammal facilities play, and just as important in my opinion, is providing a situation where the general public can directly experience marine mammals. They can learn about them and learn about the challenges they face in the wild, and they can make the emotional connections necessary to inspire conservation mindedness. Now that last point is really important 
Because any sort of conservation efforts that impact these animals are eventually gonna boil down to the millions upon millions of decisions of everyday men, women, and children. So how do you impact that? Well, we know that when you bring people into a facility like ours and you give them up close and personal experiences with these animals, they start to make a connection. They care. And it is that moment of connection, that moment of caring, that's the start of conservation mindedness. It is not enough to just give people information about conservation. Don't get me wrong, information is super important, but people have to care enough to actually go out and do something with that information. And studies have shown that experiences with animals in zoos and aquariums positively impact people's conservation-related attitudes, knowledge, and behavior. Okay, so bringing this back to the first part of the talk, uh, why do we do cognitive research or any kind of research with the dolphins? Well, first there's the obvious. Research teaches us about the animals. Having animals up close and personal allows us to learn things about them through research that we wouldn't be able to learn otherwise. Second, the knowledge that this research generates benefits the animals, both in human care and in the wild. Now, I've already mentioned a few examples of this, but just to give you one more, earlier we discussed noise pollution as a conservation issue, and I told you about research we conducted on dolphin cooperation. So now we're combining those to study what happens to dolphin cooperation when there's excess background noise. Now to our animals, it's probably just gonna mean that they're gonna miss a few more trials. It might be you know, just a slightly less fun game, but for wild animals, this will tell us about how excess noise may interfere with their cooperative hunting, which has real world impacts for them. The point being that the more we understand these animals, the better we'll be able to meet their needs, both in our facilities and with science-based conservation. Third reason, what we call cognitive research, the animals experience as thinking games. It's puzzles, it's figuring things out. These kinds of games provide mental stimulation for the dolphins. And finally, it provides an educational experience for our guests. Now we do all of our research in front of the public. We play research like games with the public and we talk about it all the time. And what this does is it provides an additional way for people to connect with the animals. You know, people connect for different reasons. Some people connect, um, they're inspired by the dolphin's beauty. Some people because of their athleticism when they see them do a really high dive. Some because they see them doing some cool thinking game. And all of that is great because the more ways we can get people connected, the more chances we'll have of getting them to hear conservation messages, to care about those messages and take active steps to conserve the animals and the environment they live in. Okay, so before I take questions, uh, I have just one more poll for, for you guys, if you would please, uh, please indicate your level of agreement with the following statement. I learned something from participating in this webinar. Did you learn a lot? Did you just learn something or did you not learn anything at all? Uh, second, how many people were watching this, uh, including you? And I am not asking you to psychically intuit what's happening all around the world. I'm just talking about in your little room, look around you, is it just you? Are there two of you? Are there three of you? Are there four or more? Um, and then third, where are you, you viewing this webinar from? Are you in Miami-Dade County right now in Florida? Are you in Monroe County in Florida? Are you not in those two counties, but somewhere else? Are you somewhere else in the US or are you elsewhere in the world? And I don't know. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Kelly, that was, that was absolutely fascinating. And we'll let the poll go for another few minutes while we finish up our housekeeping. We want to thank you so much for joining us. And it is just about 1230. So if you have to go, not a problem. We are going to stay on and have a Q&A session with Dr. Yakula at this time. As a reminder, this webinar was recorded and a link to the broadcast will be sent out within the next week. We hope that you'll join us for our final two conversations in November and December. We're going to be having one each month just due to holiday scheduling and some logistics. And in the meantime, please stay safe and well. And Dr. Yakula, if you would, please turn your camera on so that you can chat with your participants. All right, so I think I have mine on. I think I turned off being able to see it though. So can you guys all, oh wait, hold on.
I uh, got it. I got it. All right. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions either on the research that we talked about, which are the two pictures in green right there, or, you know, we do a whole lot of cognitive research. Um, so I can talk about the other things too, whether it's blindfolded imitation, whether it's concepts of number, whether it's do, can dolphins track hidden objects and so forth. So if you guys will uh, type any questions into the chat and then maybe someone will read those to me. All right. I think the way it's set up, Kelly, is only I'm able to see the questions. So I'm keeping okay. track. Robert has a two part question, which I think you answered some of. And that was, can we visit the facility where you and uh, where to go and do visitors get to see research sessions? And the other part of that was how long do dolphins live? Okay, so let's start with the first one. Yes, absolutely, you can come see us and please do come see us. Um, we are open with all of the you know relevant uh, COVID precautions being taken. Um, and yes, as I said, we do our research in front of the public. So uh, come on down and, and see it and talk to us about it. Uh, second, uh, how long do bottlenose dolphins live? I actually wrote a paper about this a, a year or, or two ago. Um, and it's interesting because if you're talking about the wild versus if you're talking about um, in human care, um, in human care, they live an average these days of 28 to 29 years. Um, that was not true 50 or so years ago, uh, you know, when, when we were first learning about these animals, but it definitely is true now. Whereas in the wild, there is no the wild, there are different populations of them. Um, and so some dolphins are doing pretty well, but even in, in the best case scenario, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember, I want to say it was about 20 years on average um, that they live. And in some cases, even less than that. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't find, you know, an older dolphin somewhere. Of course, that's how averages work. Um, but what we do know is that these days, they live as long or longer in human care uh, than they do in the wild, where, as we talked about, you know, there are a lot of conservation threats out there. Fantastic. Thank you. The next two questions are from Marsha. What programs are you able to provide live during COVID? And have you seen better health of the dolphins during COVID due to the lessening of boat traffic? Okay, so let me take the second one first um, because we, in our facility, um, there are no boats that come super close. And so, and, and the second answer is I haven't heard whether or not we've seen um, particular health differences. I, I don't believe we've been doing a specific study on that. Um, but anecdotally, just don't know. Um, and what was the first question again? Oh, what, what programs can we do? So yeah. what I want to point you to first is our website, which is at the bottom of uh, this slide right here, dolphins.org. It's very easy to remember. So you can go in there and you can see. Uh, but we're, we're offering all of our, our programs. Again, we do it with certain modifications. We keep different uh, family groups apart uh, when they are interacting with the dolphins, but uh, we're, we're doing basically all of the, the programs that we have ever done. Fantastic, that's great to hear. The next question is from Zach. He's asking, how does the signature whistle develop? Is it natural or taught? Good question. And again, this is one of those that um, is so hard to figure out because of course you can't do an experiment, or you, at least you can't do an ethical experiment, just like you couldn't with, you know, human children, um, you know, not talk to them to see whether they develop language. Uh, again, I don't want to say that that dolphins have language with a capital L. There's no evidence that they do. However, here's what we know about signature whistles. We do know that they develop over time. Um, the dolphin, baby dolphins seem to get them within the first year, seem to develop them gradually and seem to pull bits of information from different sounds in their environment and different whistles in their environment. And so for example, um, if you look at, there was a study that showed that dolphins in human care tend to have more flat components in their whistle than dolphins in the wild. And the reasoning, what people think is happening there is one of the big sounds for a dolphin is the trainer's whistle, right? The trainers blow their whistles a lot um, and that's a very happy sound for the dolphins. And so the young ones seem to be incorporating that 
um, a little bit more. Now, that's not to say that, you know, all the dolphins have that. In fact, looking at our own dolphins, I don't see that a lot. Um, but what that does tell us is that it doesn't seem like they're taught. Nobody has, has seen any evidence where you would name them or the mom would name them, for example. It seems to be something they pick up. So that's so interesting. I wish, so neat to hear how their brains work and that you're learning a little right. bit. Again, so different than us, right? <laughs> exactly. You wouldn't expect your child to develop their own name, but there you go. <laughs> Kara would like to know what research projects are you currently participating in with dolphins at the Dolphin Research Center? We are always doing as many as we can. Um, we're currently doing that one I told you about with the cooperation and noise. Um, we're also doing studies on their various behavior. I don't want to give too much away because generally, as a general rule, we even though when you come down, you can definitely see what research is going on. Um, we try not to broadcast too much of that on the internet uh, because you might try a study and then it won't work. And with dolphins, people get really excited about the research, which is cool. We love that, but not everything works out. And so we want to make sure that, you know, when we say, oh, we're studying, say some of the pictures here, we're studying dolphin number, or we're studying dolphin imitation, et cetera, um, that we have a, a final result for that. And we also, by the way, at Dolphin Research Center have a field study, which means we go out in a boat uh, and we look at dolphins in the wild as well. Again, those are different kinds of questions because those animals don't come up close and personal. We don't know them as, you know, individual, well, we know them as individuals, but not their person, their dolphinality. Um, but we're doing that as well. All right, so I'm going to pop in here. I've got a couple questions that were just sent to me from our friend Willie. Um, so we have a couple. One is a little more lighthearted than the other. So his first question is, a lot of studies seem to be circulating around the internet, which appear to have questionable validity. What is the best way a lay person at home can actually identify if a study is valid or not? That is a really good question. Um, the first thing to do is whether or not you read the scientific paper, there should be a scientific paper. A again, that sort of goes back to why we don't talk a lot about our research until it is published. And when I say published, I mean published in a peer reviewed scientific paper. So if you can't find a reference for it and it's just, oh, you know, dolphins, whatever, I don't even want to say, but fill in the blank here. Um, I would, I would look for a reference first. And if there is a reference in a peer reviewed paper that knocks it up a bunch, um, and for a lay person, that's probably the best you can do, except for the other option is, you know, when you are at marine mammal facilities like ours or like a bunch of different ones, ask the people there. These are the experts who, who work with these animals, you know, ask them what they think. That's a good point. I like that. So his second question is, um, if you could ask a dolphin any questions, what would you ask? Oh, see, it's so hard because the things that I'm interested in are how their minds work, right? That's that's what gets me up in the morning. That's what I'm very excited and I'm, I'm, I'm blessed that I have a job where I can figure that out. But let's suppose I was working with humans. And in fact, I used to. I used to work with, with little kids and I was interested in how their minds work. I wouldn't go up to them and say, hey, how does your mind work? right? Because they wouldn't know. Um, and so I wouldn't ask them directly. I can't think of anything I would ask them directly. You know, as soon as I get off this, I'm going to have a much better answer. Um, but again, I, I want to play as many fun thinking games with them to figure out how their mind works. And I'd love to be able to do some comparative work with, with humans too, again, to see not are they just like us, but how are they different and how are they the same? I, I think it's a, an important evolutionary question. Great, thank you, Kelly. Abby would like to know, what has been your favorite study? I have two answers to this. For a long time, my favorite study was blindfolded imitation. That's the one on the top right in the slide here. Um, and the thing is that, that just to give you a quick spiel on that, um, most animals don't imitate. Humans find that hard to believe because we imitate all the time. We copy each other for everything. We, we're very good at it. Most animals don't. Dolphins do. Dolphins are, are very good at imitation. Um, 
that wasn't something that we found out. But what we found out is they can do it even when they're blindfolded. Now, how do you blindfold a dolphin? You, you stick these suction cups on their eyes and if they blink, they can you know, pop them off, but the dolphins uh, allow us to put them on. And it turns out, in fact, hold on, can I real, ha, can we, can, is this pole still visible? Can I lose that? Can you guys see my screen? Yes. 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 Yep. All, right. All right, it's saying cannot play media, but we're gonna see if it's gonna let me play it. Additional permissions, hold on, boom, select. Oh, it's not, yes, it will. What I'm gonna show you is blindfolded imitation. That was the imitate sign. Now that dolphin can't see, the other dolphin gets a signal. And the first dolphin has to figure out what the other dolphin is doing, even without seeing it. And I think we have a couple more examples. Again, imitate sign. Now the imitating dolphin is blindfolded. This is swim like a shark, which means move your tail back and forth instead of up and down. And you see Tanner, that's our imitating dolphin, is a rock star there. And then third and final, imitate sign. Eye cup goes on. Let's do a spinning speed run. And you'll see that Tanner not only copies him, but cuts him off because he does it even better. All right, so for a long time, um, that study was my favorite. And, and part of the reason it was my favorite is because we kind of stumbled into it. Uh, we were looking for, hey, what else can we do with eye cups? Um, and uh, my co-director, Emily, who you see there, um, we talked about, hey, what if we try blind, blindfolded imitation? And, um, and she did it and it, it was very, very easy and they were great at it. So for a long time it was that. And then we did these cooperation studies. And the reason I love the cooperation studies is because you saw Delta and Reese in particular, all the dolphins, but Delta and Reese in particular love that game. And it is so easy to fall in love with something that they're in love with. So I love that study as well, or series of studies. That's so fascinating. Um, so I've got our next question from Zach. Uh, so he's uh, pretty much asking, where can the public freely access the research, um, you know, some of the research papers done at DRC? At DRC, so if you go to our website, and let me go back to our website so that you guys have that. Um, if you go to our website, there will be a, a, a page on there that, ta that shows all of our different publications. Um, some of them you can get just by, by clicking a link, and then other ones, if you can't, you can email us and we can send them to you, and that's that email address right there research at dolphins.org. Perfect. I'll put that in the chat. Great. Thank you, Ed. The next question is from Susana. How do you recognize that a dolphin is expecting and determine who the father is? Um, I would be the wrong person to ask on this one, except that nowadays it's very important because in the United States, Dolphins are no longer collected from the wild. They haven't been collected from the wild since 1989, which is great. What that means is that um, the gene pool is pretty fixed, except in cases where you have uh, animals who strand when they're very young or are unreleasable for, for other reasons. So my, my point is that you need to pay attention to the genetics because just like with any animal, including humans, you don't want inbreeding. So um, who, uh, makes babies with who is generally um, planned. And so we don't have to guess who the father is because we know who the father is. All right, um, our next question comes from Savannah. Uh, she said, hi, I hope I'm doing this. Uh, she said, is any of the research you've done, um, have you seen possibility that different dolphins um, have different dialects between species? also geographic regions and a difference between dialects between captive and wild dolphins? I need to unpack that question a little bit because usually when you say dialect, what is meant by that is if when you're talking about languages and differences in language. And I don't wanna go into a whole lecture here, but 
by language, what we mean are labels for things and events in the world where rules make a difference. So boy bit dog is different than dog bit boy, even though they're the same thing. I mean, same words, but just in a different order. So there is no evidence that dolphins um, have anything like that. And actually that's why I got into the field was looking for that. So, so it's not like, oh, people just aren't looking. People are looking um, and, and we haven't found evidence of that. Instead, what dolphins do is again, they, they have these individually specific whistles. And because they're taking them from different sounds in their environment, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, different dolphins in different areas had more you know, different types of elements, um, but I don't know of any research that shows that. I'm just speculating. This is, um, Kelly, I'm just grinning from ear to ear because every, every answer you give, I'm, I'm hanging on to every word and I imagine that our participants are doing the same. Oh, good. We have a great question from a young man named Ali who is 14 years old and would love to be a trainer in a few years. And Ollie is curious as to what your best advice is and was curious to know what you thought about the vaquitas, whether or not it's too late to save them due to a lack of, I guess, genetic diversity or if it was still a possibility. Okay, let me start, let me go with the depressing one first so we can end on a high. Um, and that's the, with the vaquita. Um, Unfortunately, I believe that it is too late for the vaquita, not necessarily because of the genetic diversity thing. The problem is that vaquita, for those of you who don't know, the vaquita are a uh, small cetacean, a small, small dolphin um, that is very close to extinction right now. Um, and the problem is there are so few of them and they're very skittish, animals, but what I mean is it's really hard to get close to them. It's really hard to be able to do anything with them. So for example, there have been other cases of other types of animals who are close to the edge of extinction um, that you can bring them into zoos and you can breed them uh, and then you can release them into the wild. And there have been several different animal species that have been saved from that. Um, nobody tried that with the vaquita until just a couple of years ago um, and they did not do well. Um, and, and the problem is there are so few of them now that we, it's too late. It, it's just too late. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I personally believe we should have started that project like 20 years ago before it, it, it became too late, but it is. All right, now on to happier things. Um, as far as becoming a trainer, obviously first thing you wanna do is stay in school. That's always important, no matter what it is you want to do. But but in addition for for being a dolphin trainer, um, and volunteer or find ways to get involved with animals. If you're close to a facility, uh, that's your best bet. You know whether it's DRC or any other facility, they generally have volunteer programs and intern programs, uh, etc. And so if you can do that, that's great. But if you're not near one of those uh, places, then are you near a zoo or are there a, is there a vet nearby or an animal shelter? Any sort of experience that you can get with animals is going to uh, be helpful. And then just like in any field, you want to you know, be the best you can be and don't be a jerk to people. Both of those things are, are really important. People want to work with um, other people who are good at what they do and who they like, right? All of my coworkers, I can, I can say those things about them. They're very good at what they do and we like each other. Um, and that's not an accident. And so, so both of those things. That's some great advice for sure. Um, so our next question is from Paul uh, or Richard. So Richard says, in the wild, do dolphins live in pods much like whales? Um, so dolphins have what's called, okay, let me, there are two different what we call ecotypes of dolphins. There are the inshore dolphins and the offshore dolphins. Um, and so the inshore dolphins are the ones that probably people are the most familiar with. They're the ones that tend to be in facilities and they're the ones that you'll see you know, in the waters when you're off boating, et cetera. Um, for those animals, they, they tend to live in what's called a fish infusion society, 
which means it's not like 100 animals all going around together. Um, instead, it's groups of two or three or five who hang out together and then come together and then might go apart a little bit separately. And just like, um, say with people, you know, it's not random who you hang out with and same thing with them. And so you'll have some dolphins who are sighted together almost all the time um, and some who are, who are uh, further acquaintances. Uh, that's different than offshore dolphins. Offshore dolphins um, is where you will tend to get these, these bigger pods where you have, you know, hundred or even more animals who all go around together. Fantastic, thank you. The next question, and sorry folks, I just wanna give the disclaimer that we are down to our last 10 minutes. So we'll do our best to try and address as many questions as possible, but I strongly recommend that you follow up and engage with Dr. Yakula through email and I'm sure that she'll do everything she can to try and provide as many answers as possible. Thank you for, for participating, everybody. Uh, the question that I have is from Renato. What kind of research will you have in the future? Everything. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's such a hard question. And what, it's actually an impossible question but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to give you a, a best guess. I'm gonna tell you how we go about doing things. So every once in a while, we you know, get our research team together and we sort of do a, a, a global overview of what are the questions that we're interested in. Um, and we plan that out. Uh, that's fiction, however, because then it's not always fiction. There are some of the things that are on that list that we then do next. Um, but there are also cases where we will have an outside collaborator uh, come to us and want to do a particular study. And if it's a really cool study uh, and it's you know, scientifically valid and they share our same uh, philosophy about the animals, um, then we might decide to do that one next. Or there could be you know, some uh, cool thing comes out uh, with chimpanzees or with, with other animals and we think, oh, hey, that's a cool question. Let's, let's see if we wanna do that with the dolphins as well. So we sort of have fluid plans. Now, I've said all that and I haven't given you any specifics at all. If I were to guess, um, some of the things that we want to do are things on, more things on cooperation. That's, that's a lot of fun. Um, more things on imitation also a lot of fun. Um, and we also are interested in looking more at the human animal bond. So um, dolphins are very bonded to uh, their trainers. They're, they're very important to them. And so we want to look at various aspects of uh, that important relationship. Great. Um... This sort of segues, I guess. Uh, so Jen would like to know, uh, we are members of DRC and visit frequently. Yay. We bring our dog with us and dolphins swim right up to him. They whistle at him. Has there been any studies done between the relationship of dogs and dolphins? To my knowledge, there have been no actual studies about the relationship of dogs and dolphins. I am sure that if you go online and you ask that question, you're gonna see, um, a, a video of a little dog riding on top of a dolphin and you I'm sure you can find somewhere saying hey look at this real cool quote natural interaction let me be very clear that it's not that's from the movie Zeus and Roxanne um, totally staged etc there have been I think you know you see a, a video here and there of a, a dolphin and a dog swimming together or something like that um, just like you can with almost any animal, as long as it's not a, a predator-prey situation. Um, but no, I don't know of any studies that have been done. All right, thanks, Kelly. You've been doing all this without even really getting a sip of water. So <laughs> kudos to you. Corinne would like to know, she first wanted to thank you for this fantastic presentation. And in regard to the cooperation studies, is there an initial period of training to get the dolphins to understand the desired outcomes, like pressing the button simultaneously, or do the dolphins cooperate instinctively? Oh, I was love it. I, I was about to answer that question until we get to that last word. So in, let me just unpack that a little bit. Um, the issue of instinct, we wouldn't be able to, to tell anyway. 
um, because instinct has a very biological meaning, uh, et cetera. But we can talk about what we did and whether there's learning involved. In our particular, so in some cooperation studies, you can set up a situation where it's clear what the mechanisms are. So one of the most famous um, types of studies that's done, that's usually done to study cooperation is, is what's called the rope pulling task or the string pulling task. And the way that it works is you have uh, a rope or a string that is threaded through a platform, it starts on one side, it's threaded around a platform into the other side. So you have two ends to the rope and you have them far enough apart. So this was first done with chimpanzees. You have them far enough apart so that one chimp can't pull both at the same time. Um, but if you just pull one side, it unthreads. So you can see there's a causal mechanism there. They can see what's gonna happen. In those, you don't need to do much, if any, training. For ours, there are reasons that we didn't want to use that, a number of, of, of different reasons, but one of them being that it's possible that the animals could learn, oh, when the, when the rope starts moving, that's when I pull. So instead we wanted to do this task. In our particular task, at least this, this first set of studies, um, there's no way that they could intuit that we have to press them at the same time. So instead we had to train that. Um, and in fact, our first paper is about how they went about learning the task. So you saw that at the end, um, they didn't really hurry. They, uh, the videos that I showed you, one would wait, the other one would swim kind of slowly, et cetera. In the very beginning, what we did is we taught them, okay, press your buttons individually. Then we had, a, we would send them like, okay, from the other side of the lagoon, go together. Now from the other side of the lagoon, but we're gonna send you a second apart, which isn't very long, but it's long enough. Um, and they had to then sort of by trial and error, figure out what worked and what didn't. We didn't tell them the answer, but we set up a situation where they could learn the answer. Uh, and in fact, the way it was really interesting because you could see when one of them learned it because almost invariably one of the dyad, one of the two dolphins would learn it before the other one. And in those situations, if that dolphin was the one who was supposed, who was still with the trainer, the other dolphin is sent first, and this first dolphin knows we have to do it together, it was really, really hard to get them to wait because they're like, no, I gotta go, gotta go. And in fact, what you would see is that as soon as they would release, they would make a beeline, like you've never seen a dolphin swim so fast to get to the, to the button. But once they both understood the game, you saw a change in the attitude, you saw a change in how they did it. Delta and Reese, the ones that you saw that did that little you know, happy dance at the end of it, they, they were actually very funny in that you would send one and he would go wander around the lagoon and then you'd send the other and he'd go you know, over there, talk to some dolphins, et cetera. And then at some point they'd meet together and then they'd touch the buttons. Um, but once they knew they had to do it together, it, there wasn't as much urgency. Did I answer the question? I think so. I think you were good on that. So we have time for one final question. Um, and so we're going to go to Stevie for this one. Um, and again, if you have any follow up after the presentation, you can always send them to the email on the screen. Um, but yeah, so Stevie asks, how do you respond to guests who are stuck on what they heard from the Blackfish movie and say that captivity is cruel without getting into a very long discussion? with them? How do I do this without getting into a very long discussion? Um, I actually do get into long discussions is, is how I do it. Um, but, uh, and there are so many things even in that question that you just asked. So Blackfish, if, if, they, if they bring up Blackfish in particular, we talk about Blackfish and the different issues with it and the fact that it was a very good propaganda movie, but that's what it was. And so you need to look at um, what is the actual truth, right? You need to look at what are, the, what are the facts here? Let's look at dolphin lifespan. Let's look at, you know, what would it mean if a dolphin was thriving? And what I tell them is that no matter what measure you use, whether you're talking about uh, lifespan or are they active and reactive, et cetera, by every single measure that you can think to use, dolphins in good facilities are thriving. Now to be clear, I am I, I will be the first to say that any animal, including dolphins, including humans, do not 
thrive in poor situations, right? Absolutely. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, accredited good facilities. Um, the dolphins are doing great. They're, they're, just look at the various measures. And then we talk about those. So that's why I say it, it, I, I, I never want to give people a pat answer to that because it is an important question. How are the dolphins doing? Right? Are they doing well? Do they have good welfare? That's very, very important to us. And we don't want to cut off conversation about that. We want to have conversations about that as long as they're actual conversations that are based on, all right, let's look at the data. Well, Kelly, I think you answered that <laughs> pretty succinctly, but oh, pretty thoroughly at the same time. So Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm glad that that question was asked because I think it is important and it is, we do have a lot more access to information at different levels. And so that is how a lot of the members of our, of our communities are starting to learn about some of the issues. And I think it's extremely important that you and your staff and your coworkers are here to be able to encourage those dialogues and keep people better informed. Yeah. So, Thank you so much for joining us today. This was truly fantastic. Ed, I know I, I can speak on behalf for Ed. We've both been thrilled with this. And, you know, we hope to work with you again soon. And we encourage everyone to go visit you down in Marathon. Yeah. And for those of you who have joined us for your first conservation conversation, we want to thank you. And we hope that you'll join us in November for Sensational Sharks. And in December, for Girls Gone Wild, not what you think, the women of South Florida's national parks. So with that, we wanna thank you all again and please stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, Dr. Yakula. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.